Welcome everyone. I'm Nicole Demers, Governor of the Writers Peer Group at the Television Academy. A huge thank you to our panelists for making time on a Saturday to chat with us. I'm such a huge fan of all your work and we're really honored to have you. Our panel today is on limited series, namely why they're so hard to make and how to make them anyway. A bit of housekeeping before we start, we're pre-recording this panel, so unfortunately there won't be an audience Q&A, but hopefully we'll cover most of your questions during our chat. So please sit back and enjoy. So welcome everyone. I'd love to start with introducing our panelists. Uh, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, say your name, the name of the living series that we're here to talk about today. And finally, what you love to write, like what gets you jazzed and makes you wanna to go to your computer every day? If maybe we could start with Lane. I guess hi. in your case, it'd be producing. <laughs> I was gonna say, hi, yeah. my name is Lane Estridge. I'm the executive producer on Manhunt, um, which is a limited series on Apple TV. Um, and I'm not a writer, so I can, but I'll try to adjust the question for me. Um, I love stories and advocating for storytellers. So that's what makes me get up and do my job every morning. Awesome. Davi, can we move to you? Sure. Hey everyone, I'm Davi Waller. I'm the creator of Mrs. America. I guess what gets me jazzed in the morning is thinking about really complex, fascinating characters. Hey, it's Brad Inglesby with Mayor of Easttown. Um, I'm with Davi. I think it's really just about characters. That's, I don't, I'm not very good with plot. So it's like, if I have a great character, that's really what interests me most and trying to figure out a way to tell that character story in like an honest, emotional way, really. Hi, I'm Monica Bletsky. I'm the showrunner creator um, of Manhunt for Apple TV. And, um, Oh gosh, I don't know. Um, I just love collaboration and I love that we get to use our imagination to create, um, you know, these incredible characters and worlds together. And I love when you bring together different artists or writers and we come up with something that I didn't have, you know, when I woke up. Um, uh, my name is Anna Winger. I made a show called Unorthodox. I, I'm a showrunner, writer, uh, creator, but I'm also a producer of my own work. Um, and I guess what gets me up in the morning is just the three ring circus. I, I, I'm, I love that there's so much of it. You know, I was a photographer for 15 years and I come to writing from photography. So there's just something about creating the story with this and bringing all these people together to make um, some kind of crazy magic that is very exciting to me. Amazing. Well, again, welcome. Um, we'll just dive right into the questions. Uh, so I think that, you know, one of the inspirations for this panel was, you know, we're, as creators, we're often told how hard it is to get a limited series uh, sold and how hard it is to make it. And I think on the flip side, it's, you know, can be often confusing because audiences love them they can often drive a lot of A-list talent who wouldn't sign on for like a five-year run. And they can also drive a lot of awards for broadcasters and streamers. So maybe I'll start with you, Lane, as a resident EP on the panel. Why do you think limited series are so challenging to sell? And how can we as creators make it easier on ourselves? There's definitely um, a higher bar at networks. And I actually was a buyer before, um, most recently at Apple TV+, Plus, but um, also at Netflix for a long time. And there's definitely a higher bar for limited series. Really, it's a, it's a financial thing because you can only amortize over one season. Um, and what people can do, I think, honestly, the name of the game for limited series is packaging. Um, strong IP, like in our case with Manhunt. Um, and also, it's an opportunity to play with stars that don't normally um, work in television. Uh, Brad brought up characters and that's what excites him. And when I watched Mayor of Easttown, I could not take my eyes off Kate Winslet, you know? Um, and so I think that that is usually the recipe for limited series. But I also think in the case of Manhunt, because this was really something that we developed, it, it was an idea Monica had, um, and we actually went and found IP to support it. Um, we're telling a story in a way that hasn't been told um, that um, we're kind of saying something different about the moment in history that we haven't before in the same way that Chernobyl and some other really big um, limited series had. So I think there's either something um, that can start a conversation or it's, you know, IP and talent or both, but the, it's, you know, the bar is higher at the same time. Um, the reward is higher too, because I think you really get your moment 
to be a critical success, but also have that audience reach as well, which as a former buyer that, you know, that was the home run. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Um, if anyone, like I said, if anyone wants to jump in with anything else, please feel free or I'll go on to our next question. Well, uh, I, can, I can say something maybe, which is, yeah, is interesting, which is that um, it's, I've only ever made it limited series. I think things are structured very differently in the UK and in Europe where I'm American, but I live in Germany and Berlin. And, um, and I, I would never think that it's harder to sell a limited. It wasn't only because you said that when we met before, I, I, that's something that wouldn't have occurred to me. I don't think that um, because the work isn't, isn't generally, you don't have the same writer's room kind of system as you do in America. Um, people are much more likely to make shorter runs of projects. And if it's good and everybody wants more, then they'll make another limited series of it. But it's not, I'm like, I made three seasons of my first show, but it wasn't really like seasons. Each one was its own limited series with the same characters. Um, they, they were set three years apart. It's called Deutschland 83. And I made it for channel four and it was, um, you know, there was no pushback at the idea that first we make the first season, we make a season, we make a show. And if people like it, then we make a trilogy of shows, but it's not, I think it's, it's different depending on who the buyer is. Fair enough. So we're all, we're all moving to Europe. <laughs> no, no. I mean, also, I mean, on Orthodox, I made for Netflix, which is everywhere, but it's, I think yes. it really depends on the project. I don't know if I, my observation is that things are kind of changing and that there's not the same uh, way that things are made. There's like a lot of different shapes and sizes for projects. And it really depends on what's dictated by the material. Yeah, no, fair enough. I mean, I think that there's uh, the, the great point that Lane brought up about the amortization over multiple seasons seems to be a very American phenomenon. I'm originally from Canada and the same thing is they don't quite look at it like that because television series never make money. <laughs> so you know, they're always a money losing proposition. So therefore it's not maybe as uh, important. Um, Monica, I'd love to jump to you. You had um, this great take that I thought was really important to bring up that we as writers love history, love diving into the history. Um, but that's not necessarily what the audiences are looking for. What do you think is needed to make a successful limited series, in your opinion? Um, well, if it's historical, I sort of learned my lesson from having a screenplay that everybody in town has pretty much read, but I'll never get made. That's a dramatic hist historical screenplay. And that's um, that it didn't have genre to it. It was just straight drama. And I think those are the hardest to make because you have to convince an audience and buyers to be interested in a topic in history that they they aren't necessarily interested in. You might find it fascinating, but you know, for other people, it sort of feels like homework. So the thing that I really learned over the last couple of years is that genre is your friend. And that, you know, like I had an idea for something that was, you know, very niche history thing that I was really obsessed with. And then I decided, you know, to add a creature to it. And suddenly the same people I was pitching to were like, oh, cool, you know, because suddenly it was science fiction. So um, same thing with Manhunt, you know, I, I pitched it as a, as a, um, as a thriller, as more of a cat and mouse detective story um, than a straight historical show. And I really think that that brings you so much more interest and audience who wouldn't necessarily be interested in that topic, but they do like that genre. And so they'll come to it for the genre and you'll sort of, like Jordan Peele says, Trojan horse, you know, them into wanting to watch it. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. And, and, and add that to IP and, and that's kind of a winning combination there. Yeah. I would add to what Monica is saying. I think she's totally right that at the heart of, of that, whether it's a genre or, or really fascinating character that you start with, it's about, it has to be entertaining. Like at, at the very prime, it's like, is this an entertaining story? Is this a ride that audiences are gonna go on? It can't just be interesting in like a cerebral way. It has to actually really be poppy and fun. And I think one of the things I, in my work, I've tried to do is take these historical moments in time and that have resonance for where we are today and then think of them as just a fictional story and what would make like a really fascinating fictional story. And then the, you can't just rest on the fact that the truth is cool. It has to be that it make a story if it wasn't true. Yeah, I mean, that, that actually, if we can 
dig a little deeper in that. I think that's really interesting because one of the questions I had for you, Davi, was, you know, limited seems so well suited to telling, uh, you know, historical or real life stories. And sometimes as writers, I think we struggle with um, telling the facts and only the facts versus taking some poetic license with the material. Um, do you mind walking us through a bit of that journey for Mrs. America? Sure. Um, I was actually a history major, so I think I have more reverence for the facts than other writers, and, I, and I'm jealous of those writers who are like, take the facts. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I wish I was a little <laughs> more loose about facts. But um, unlike when you're telling a fictional story where you just say, what's the most exciting story and what's the arc of these characters over a period of a series, with true, life, with true history or true life, um, whether it's true crime or historical moment, you have to find the human drama through the facts. And um, it's just a different process. And I remember in our writer's room, the writers talked about this just a very different way of breaking story than a pure character-driven fictional drama or a procedural. And um, I think, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> you're gonna get, someone's gonna criticize you for getting the facts wrong. So my attitude is just go for what's really a great story because you, you're not gonna win the facts. There's always someone yeah. who loves to tweet at you that you got this right. wrong or that wrong. <laughs> And the truth is, even with history, like what are facts? And like, yes, they're facts of history, but the narrative you're telling is subjective. Like I had a point of view that I brought to Miss America. Another person would look at the same facts and tell, see a different story there. So I do think you just have to say, what is the most compelling story that I want to tell here? Yeah, that makes, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, Brad, I don't want to leave you out, but uh, you were mentioning that you had a couple of scripts written when you sold Mayor of Easttown. Uh, like, do you, I'm sorry. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, like, do, yes. Do you think that played a role in getting it greenlit? Like there's always that debate about how much do I write before I try to sell this versus a really great pitch and hoping you could speak a bit to that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think the reason we sold it was Kate. I mean, let's be right. honest, I think, you know, I think, I, I think uh, I'd be lying if I said it was the scripts, but I think what writing the scripts does as I said to you, Nicole, and it's certainly a risk and, and I understand why, uh, you know, there's a reluctance to do it. But um, I think what I was, um, I think the reason I wrote the scripts was that when we had Kate and we were able to go into the rooms, you, know, you have a bit more leverage and you could say, this is the show we're making. Are you guys gonna make this show? As opposed to pitching, which we've all done, instantly invites other opinions into the story and you know, everyone wants a level of ownership over the story. And so, Again, it's a risk, and and I've written spec scripts that have gone absolutely nowhere and still in my shelves. And um, so I think it's a risk, but I think what it gives you is you're able to walk into a room again and say, "Hey, this is the show we want to make. Are 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 we open to notes and tweaks? Of course, but <laughs> but um, but this is the story we want to tell." And I think that's what writing the scripts actually does. It, ju it just gives you a bit more leverage when you're talking to networks. Uh, and obviously having Kate is, is, is enormous and Kate was on board with the scripts and the character arc. So, and so that was the reason I chose to write the scripts really was just that we were able to go in and pitch a show that was formed already as opposed to going in and saying, hey, we have this idea, but we're open to changing any arcs in the story. No, we were saying, this is the story, this is the community. And is this a story you guys want to tell or not? I'm just curious, quick poll. I'm just wondering how many um, creators had scripts going in or was it pitching for you? Like just a pitch, great pitch. I I, pitched, I sold it as a pitch, wrote pitch, okay. two episodes and a format, still mm -hmm. wasn't greenlit. And then I got another Kate, Kate Blanchett, and that <laughs> also was the thing, like Brad, got a, he got a cast of Kate. Is kind of Every, like, everyone is taking perfect. notes, so like, get Kate. Get someone named Kate, yes. <laughs> there you go. How, how was, you... I, one second, I was just gonna say something yeah, because please. Davi and Brad, I think are drawing, a, there's a through line there, which I agree with Brad that proof of concept is really great when you're a buyer and being able to, pitches are fun, you know, but it's like talking about what could be. Um, and the scripts are like, I, I think there's trends. I think it goes in waves. Sometimes pitches are there in vogue. Sometimes people want spec scripts, but I agree it's proof of concept. And you can kind of say, I have my script. I have my partners. I'm ready to go, which as a buyer, you're like, great, get going. But I was going to say, um, maybe I would love to hear a little bit about the packaging of both, both Brad, because you came in with a piece of talent and Davi because you went and found one because I think 
that is like the chicken or the egg, you know, sometimes during the green light process, it's like, I love this, but who can play it? And so I think that is also um, when you attach someone, how you attach someone, like how people come to get on a project. I always love hearing those stories. I think it's different each time. Um, and there is, you know, I think both Kate's, I think anywhere they matter, but it is, it is, a, it's a, it's like a game, you know? So I'd love to hear more because I don't actually know how either Kate was attached to those projects. And I'd like to know. You want to go first, okay. Abby? Go ahead. Well Oh, yeah. Oh, I was going to ask you, Brad, did you, it sounds like you, you went in, instead of pitching it, you went in with Kate and the scripts to yeah. all to the market, right? Right, exactly. That, yeah, yes, that was our process. I'll also add that I would say this, one of the reasons I do write stuff is I don't have high concept stuff at all. So my, so everything I've written on spec is really character driven. So if I were to pitch Mayor of East Town to anybody without Kate Winslet, no one's going to buy that show. There's nothing unique at all about it, really, if you think about it. So I really, I almost have to show some level of execution because I am going to say, this is all about a character who's trying to get over the death of her son. But if I were to pitch that show in the room, I'd probably be laughed at. I mean, we've seen that story a million times. So anyway, just to say that, I think if I had a higher concept, I may be, you know, I would go out and try to pitch it. In terms of Kate, um, I knew her agent a little bit and I had done some business with Hilda a few times in the past. And so I think she represents Kate Planchett too, actually. Yeah. And she's great. And so I had the two scripts and it was just a stroke of luck. I think Kate was getting ready to do Ammonite. It's a period love story, totally different from Mayor of Easttown. Um, I think she was looking to challenge herself and do something she'd never done before. She'd never held a gun in any role, which I I was amazed by Kate's been in so many movies. And and, um, and so we just kind of caught her at the right time lane. Really, it was really, I, I mean, I mean this sincerely, it was just luck. I think she was home and she was able to read scripts right away. And it just so happened that this script was something that she was sort of interested in doing. And my experience with, a, you know, every actor is, has been, it's just like the right place, right time for that initial piece is just right timing. Like the timing means everything. And I think with Kate, it was just timing and I um, just feel like, a, you know, just luckiest writer in the world to have Kate because not only is she incredible, but she's so kind. And anyway, it was just a stroke of luck, really. So I think I had a backwards experience of having pitched it, sold it to FX where my EP had a deal. So we ended up going to FX first look and they bought it. And it was really two years in that it was just, you know, you get to that. I'm sure every writer has been here. You've been developing for a long time. They keep ordering another script and then a format. And then they're just not pulling the trigger. And, and they're like, what do we need to do? We need to get the biggest movie star we could possibly get. And literally that's all I said. And um, my two executive producers knew Hilda and had lunch with her. And by this is just luck. Kate with a C had been interested in Phyllis Schlafly and had really sort of, it was a character she had wanted to play. So that just was a great convergence of, but like Brad says, a lot of it is luck, unfortunately. I hate to say it. <sighs> so, so much luck and timing. And I just want to bring you in here because you, I feel like you had the opposite experience. I mean, Sherry Haas was incredible and unorthodox. Like, I feel like I haven't seen a, a woman chew up the screen like that since maybe Winona Ryder first appeared. Like, it, she was just, I could just watch her, like that old joke or watch her read a phone book on screen. So, I mean, you didn't have a big name. Uh, like, how did you get it made with, um, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think she was unknown pretty much at that point, right? At least in North America. You know, I've never cast a show, including the show that I'm about to start next week. I've never cast the show until we've, we're ready to make it. So I think, again, I think my experience is kind of not relevant to the process in Hollywood, but it, it, I've always written like a pitch, a pretty extensive pitch. I've had a really strong idea of the execution of the show. I've only made three shows. Um, and I, I didn't have any experience prior to that as a screenwriter. So it's always been like, here's everything about it. Here's how it's gonna look. Here's how I wanna make it. Here's all of it. Here's the music, whatever. But um, I've only, the process is, this development process is different. So like, we've only really written the show. I've only written the whole show when I had a green light to, for production. And then uh, in that process done the casting. And in the case of Shira, who's I'm sorry, incredible. sure, I said her name wrong. I apologize. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. um, you know, we probably looked at like 60 actresses all across Europe and in, the, in New York and in uh, London. And then 
we were like two months, three months out from shooting and we hadn't found anybody to, to play this role. And it was really specific. And then we went to Israel and Israel just turned out to just be this incredible experience. And we ended up casting a lot of the show in Tel Aviv, which was amazing, you know? Um, and we, we had made a decision early on because we were producing out of Germany that we only wanted to cast Jewish actors in the Jewish roles because it was, we were shooting in Yiddish and we didn't want, um, we, it was, since no one, very few people speak Yiddish, but we wanted to um, try and find actors who had a relationship to the language, either through with their grandparents, um, you know, like I do, I don't speak Yiddish, but my grandparents spoke it. It was important uh, to us to, to approach the material that way, simply because in Germany, there's been so much work that's done about Jews and Jewish history uh, that stars only uh, non-Jewish Germans. So that was a kind of approach we took. And then we had a lot of trouble finding actors. So, and then, um, yeah, we were really lucky. And she's just, it, what was crazy, that was one of those moments where like every single person involved in, in the process on any level was like, she's the one, you know? And then once we had her, like we had the show and we were off to the races and that was maybe three months before we started shooting, so yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's such an interesting uh, take to have an international perspective because, you know, limited series can often include multiple countries. And so, you know, um, having that perspective of like, when do I get another country involved? When do I get, you know, co-production going uh, is, you know, really valuable. But I'd love to, because it's, you know, we sort of got into packaging a bit, I'd love to hear from all of you when you got your producer involved. I think that's such a key, you know, finding that, per finding your person, right? Finding that advocate who's going to fight just as hard for this project as you do. Um, it's, uh, I know I'm personally going through it right now. <laughs> it's everything. I'd love to hear how you guys got your producers attached and, and how you find your, that person. Well, since mine's here, I'll, yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> Say nice things. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, Lane is incredible. She actually has two limited series right now. Her other one is starring Mahershali, the plot. Um, so she could probably also answer that question about how she got her talent attached. But um, I, I um, was brought into Apple um, to pitch ideas and try to get an overall deal. And Lane really shepherded that when she was there. And before that, I had been on really well-known shows and beloved shows, and I really had a hard time making the switch from being someone who everybody knew was great on staff to being given my own show. And I actually, like, I've never met Davi before, but I have to say, like, you were one of my inspirations because there were very few women being allowed to do limited series until a couple of years ago the the our panel right now the breath is the minority here it was very unusual in this in this category until recently and when I saw you get your limited series it really gave me hope because I kept getting almost there and not getting quite there and so and she really I I think was probably the first woman at FX to to get a show like that so um, can I just say, Monica, that I actually tried to hire you on Miss America, but oh, really? you were <laughs> overall, and I was like, too late. She's already on to creating her own show. So I knew before you did, you were you were making that leap. I just have to tell you. Thank you. That's really sweet. Um, so uh, when I did that, I brought in a couple of ideas, and um, you know, Lane really uh, ran with it. So I came up with um, the idea of doing, you know, limited about the aftermath of the assassination of Lincoln. And I didn't have IP, I didn't have a star. And um, she and her partner and her company, Kate Berry, who's a real expert on books, she really tracks books really well. They came to me like a couple of weeks later and they were like, I think we got you this book about the thing that you want to do. And I was like, what? Um, so that was really amazing. And then um, it really went from there. Um, but she's really been the, the key person that has looked at me in a different way and, and taken my career to the next level because of what she saw in me. So amazing. You might get a lot of calls after this lane. <laughs> Amazing. Um, <laughs> how, how about uh, how about you, Brad? How did you get your uh, producer touched? Um, yeah, and and so I was working. So I had worked with Mark Roybal. Um, oh my goodness, uh, probably like ten years prior to Mayor of Easttown. We had he was working at Indian Paintbrush, which was a 
I'm not sure if it's still around. I know they, at the time they were doing a lot of Wes Anderson movies. I'm, I'm, I'm not certain if Indian Paintbrush is around, but I met Mark at Indian Paintbrush and he was just a friend for a long time. And, and, and I had, um, I think I had lunch with him and he said he was getting into TV and I said, oh, you know, I had this idea that I was kind of writing myself. And again, I think it was just like timing. I sent him the script. I think I'd written one episode and he really liked it. But, um, you know, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's just having someone you trust, like Monica said with Lane, like, it seems like you guys have such a great thing. And, and it's amazing, Lane, that you support someone like that, because I can count on one hand the number of people I've met in my 12 or so years I've been out here who I would want to be in the trenches with. So good for you guys. I mean, it's, it's so meaningful. I'm telling you, it's, um, you know, because when you think about how many of the battles you're going to have to fight uh, along the way, you know, on, on set, in the edit, I'm, oh my goodness. I mean, um, you really need someone that is gonna share the vision of the show, I think. I think that's what it comes down to. And with Mark, you know, I think we were always in sync as to what the show is really about. And, and that was a woman and, and grief and confronting grief. And so, so whenever there was an issue, we were always on the same page about the theme of the show. And if anything was taking us away from that, and it has to be entertaining, like Davi said, it really has to be entertaining. You have to embrace the genre in ways, but at its core, what is the show about? And I think Mark always understood that um, and always was going and was always willing to have a fight about that and keeping that as the core of the show. So yeah, it was just, it's a long relationship and um, and just getting to know someone over time and really being able to trust them when, you know, when you're in the trenches and go, is this person gonna have my back? And I, I, I always knew Mark was gonna have my back. Nice. I'm not gonna answer this question, but I just wanted to say, I love Mark Roybal and he is such an advocate and has amazing taste. And he's someone when I was a buyer that I like tried to collaborate with several times because he's- Oh, that's guy. sweet. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell him you said that, Lane. Yeah, he's yeah. a great guy. He really is one of the good guys. I I mean, he's a great guy, Mark. And um, I was about to say that I've had very few meetings in Hollywood, but I have met with him, and he was really great. I was also really struck by how he. I can. I'm pleased to hear that it's like that because that doesn't surprise me. I've um, never met Mark, but I'd like to. Meet him. <laughs> I'd love to meet him. Mark. <laughs> great job. I'd really love to meet you, Doug. So, I, I can, feel like I, I feel like. Mark should be paying us for this or something at this point now. It's free publicity. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love to bring Anna in. Uh, so I don't always need to go to you last, but I'd love to hear, because you produce it yourself through your own company. So was that like a conscious choice that you couldn't find someone to produce your limited and you said, well, I'll just have to do it myself? Or um, was it, you know, I mean, often just fumbling through life the way we do. Well, you know, I, I, I have such a weird situation. You know, I'm American. I live in Germany. I write in English. I don't, I, there is no, it, there, it, it's not, I didn't start a company with any concrete ambition, except for that there wasn't anyone else to produce my work. Do you know what I mean? There wasn't anyone else who would work in the way that I would work. Um, and it kind of went from there. I had one bad experience uh, with you know, in early days, a feeling that there was a disconnect between the way I was seeing what I was doing with the, a German um, company. And I just felt like that wasn't the way forward for me. So it, I, I think also the system is different. I feel like I keep saying that, but it's, it's just, um, were I to be living in my own country, I think I would, I would work like everybody else does, but it's just here. Um, my company grew out of my situation and now I, you know that's what we do right so i have amazing young women work mostly i shouldn't say young women there is one man but there's a lot of uh, people working uh for me who are really like just such stars and it's a privilege to be able to teach them to do things the way i do it and the way i think about it and to see them shine as producers and as writers as well so it's it has grown organically you know, through my work, but but now it's taking on a life of its own. And we're all here in Marseille, you know, at the end of the edge of Europe, uh, about too, to go into production again. So, yeah, not, no, it's too, really, not too bad of a lifestyle. No, do you, I just just really quickly. Oh, just, can I jump? Oh, yeah. oh sorry. Oh, please, can I go add ahead, to yeah. that question before you move please. on? I just yeah, because you said something like, "How do you find the producer to produce your show?" And I just want to, you know, in 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 Hollywood at least, has the 
creator of the show and the showrunner of the show, you are producing your own show. So like you actually don't exactly. need another producer to produce your yeah. show. And there's a, a, we don't have time for all the, the, <laughs> the long history of how TV shows have merged with features and now there are many more producers on TV shows than ever before. But um, so I would just say to writers, if you do bring on a producer, they need to be a huge value add and they need to be able to help you like Lane, you know, help you get your, your show made. And if they aren't a value add, I would actually say, you know, you want to be really judicious about that. And like with Miss America, my producer, like, pitched Phyllis Schlafly and the Equal Rights Amendment. That was the kernel of the idea that got my head spinning to then create Miss America. So of course she's an EP on the show. So you, you have to, there has to be a purpose for every producer. So I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, no, no, no that's, that's, what that's- What you're that's, saying actually, sorry, what she's saying locates the thing that doesn't exist outside of the United States. The writer producer doesn't exist, right? So if you're a writer, you're completely beholden to like non-writing producers who control the process, right? Writers do not participate in the production of their own work. And since I came to this as a photographer, where I always produce my own work, it was a natural extension of the work I'd done before. So that's, and I wanted to work like Davi, you know, I didn't want to work, I didn't want to be separated from the execution of my own writing. So that was the thing that all of you do naturally was something that I just kind of had to make the road by walking here, but it's, it's everyone in America already does it. That, that's the that's the difference yeah yeah no and I think I think it's really an important point that you bring up Davi but I mean having people of all different levels of their career you know if you don't have an overall if you're not a minted showrunner um, often having a producer can make the difference of getting that green light right and you know having um, the network or the streamer having that confidence that this producer can deliver whereas you haven't maybe necessarily proven yourself so I don't know like Lane do you want to do you want to just take before we move on do you want to just take that like what what's the difference between do you approach it differently when you work with say somebody who hasn't show ran versus you know somebody who already has done it like is that a different process for you I think everything is case by case mm -hmm. um and I think honestly everything's been said um and manhunt is my first um limited that I am producing because I was a buyer for 15 you know like the, the majority of my career so um, I think everything's been said, but it's, it's all case by case. It's like every single person. Cause I think even when you are working, like when I was a buyer and I was working with people that had done many shows, the process really had to fit the show and the person. So yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, Davi, I wanted to get into a little bit of the process. Cause I think that so much IP is just naturally, oh, that's going to make a great limited series. And you had a really great point, uh, that, and I want to get the language right. Cause of course it's uh, so subtle that, you know, a limited series could be like eight, 10 hour movies versus an eight hour movie, right? A subtle wordplay, but you know, I mean, it, it, it really is a big difference. And, you know, i uh, love to, you to speak to that process. Yeah, I think, you know, I, again, I think one of the reasons limited series has become so popular is because the kind of grown up movies, mid range movies stopped being made. So they became limited series. Um, and I think part of, and a lot of, you have a lot of uh, feature producers and writers working on limited series. So I think I sometimes would hear like, oh, well, we're making an eight hour movie. We're making a 10 hour movie. And I, and I always correct and say, no, we're making 10 one hour movies because every hour has to stand alone. It doesn't mean it's not serialized, but it has to stand alone. I, the worst, like for me, if someone says about any of a show of mine, it gets really good at episode five, then I think I failed. <laughs> like I think you have to, you have to really get them off of that. And every hour has to have a satisfying uh, beginning, middle, and end, even though there's a larger arc. And I think sometimes we think of limited as a long movie, but um, I, I, I always want to, you know, I would say in the writer's room, like, we have to make sure is this one hour really fucking great? Sorry, I don't know if I'm sorry. Really, really great. <laughs> or is it just setting up? Like, are we, you know, are we just treading water in the middle of the series? It really has to feel propulsive all the way through. So mm -hmm. just it's a more of a creative point. <laughs> they always make. You know, I don't think how long it, I don't think it matters how long it is. I think there's lots of, I mean, I've made eight, 10, four, I'm making six, seven. Yeah, I think it's not, what's kind of fun about it is that it doesn't, there isn't just one version of it, um, but every hour counts. I agree with that a hundred percent. Every minute of it counts. Yeah, it's really, I hadn't thought of that. That's a very interesting insight yeah. about, um, about that, the mid-range movie, because those were, of course, all the movies I liked too. I, you're absolutely right. It's hadn't thought of it in those terms. 
I know, as a viewer, I miss those so much, but uh, but Limited mm -hmm. has definitely come in to fill that space a bit. Um, yeah. Somebody mentioned earlier about the downside of attachments, because I think, you know, as a creator, you think to yourself, okay, I got to get a producer. Uh, I got to somehow figure out how to get A-list talent. I, you know, I got to, I got to drive this, you know, hopefully you have some partners to help you, but you might be driving it all on your own. Maybe you even got your own IP, right? You're writing the scripts. Like there's just a lot of pressure. And I think that there's a natural tendency for writers and creators to say like the first yes you get, you know, it doesn't matter who it is. You're just like, yes, okay, I got somebody. Finally, now we can move forward. And there's some, a great point brought up about, you know, interrogating the value add of those attachments, because if you do attach the wrong producer, maybe that streamer doesn't want to work with them, or you attach the wrong actor and you don't even know it, but maybe they're going to just automatically say no, that they don't want to work with that person or what have you. So it's just, it can be like a, just a minefield. Does anyone want to speak to maybe like giving some advice on, on navigating that as a creator? Let's just say if you make the wrong mistake, you're not going to be the first person to do that, make that mistake. I mean, I think Sorry. all of us have that experience, you know, it's, it's, like I said, you know, I started a company because I had a bad experience. So I think that there is, you know, I think everybody can probably, probably has a story, but, you know, it's a, you really have to find someone. I thought what Brad said about Mark is really true. It's like, and this is true for the people you're working with on many levels, right? In many different positions, but you need to have the same vision of what you're doing uh, because when you're in the trenches and it gets really rough, you have to make sure that you're making the same show. And that's- um, Great point. Yeah. I would also say to challenge yourself to define attachment as broadly as you need um, because sometimes there's not the right actor or actress at the onset, but there is an amazing director that could really add value and that could get a show greenlit. Um, and so I would think it doesn't always have to be an executive producer or an actress. And I actually think executive producers probably last on the list, you know, um, because of what Dobby said about TV and how a lot of times the showrunner can be that singular EP2, you know, and we forget that because that was the way we used to do it for a really long time and it worked. Um, so I would say think about it broadly and not just define it as a piece of talent, you know, that will not define piece of talent as an actor or an actress. Yeah. No, that, that's a great point. Did any of you have directors attached? I don't mean to leave out directors. That's awful of me. <laughs> do you have any like directors that you went to that like uh, this person would be perfect for my project? Didn't have any directors attached. We we hired them all after we got greenlit. Um, you know, I will say that it's like a little like gamble. Like you can't game the market, and especially now in this post middle of COVID or post COVID, however we're defining this period we're in, the market is so all over the place. And I'm hearing of projects that have gone out with huge talent and auspices attached, not selling anywhere. Huge showrunners with multiple shows on the show, not selling anywhere totally green writers, no attachments selling. So it, it, I just want to, like, there is no monopoly board to this. It is a little, but I do, I do think time and time again, when, when I think about the shows that everyone's talking about, they're amazing writing and amazing stories. And so I want to give all the writers listening to this, just the confidence that in a really compelling story is going to find its way. That is what ultimately buyers and audiences want is just a great story well told and just you know you look at succession and queen's gambit none of them had stars but everyone's talking about it. just really so um even chernobyl right like yeah chernobyl, like, yeah yeah so i i you know I, it's all it is worthwhile to have this conversation and i do think an undeniable package can make a huge difference so it's re at the same time the flip side of that is you have an, what you think is an undeniable package and it doesn't even sell I don't know if that's been other people's experiences. And then back to directors. <laughs> I was going to say something similar because the three pilots that I've sold, none of them had anyone attached. And this was my first one with IP, but they were just original ideas. And they just were in the pitch, in the concept. It was the story and it was the relationship between the main characters. Something about it was like very universal, but also very specific. And I, I really think that's sort of the key because um, if you can get the executive to feel something or to relate to something in that relationship that they can't forget, that is going to stay with them 
really honestly, like almost to the point of if you have these major stars, but maybe they're not connecting to what that core relationship is. So I, I think that's a really important thing. And I, I think limited series, um, Davi, you, you, you described them so well and structurally. And I also think because we know the ending essentially of a season, that's what they have in common with movies and that you can kind of say, we're, get, we're, we're gonna give you this whole story and we can tell you what the end is as opposed to an ongoing series, which some people do know the end to their ongoing series, but it's sort of like you are, you are saying, I'm gonna deliver you this whole story. And when you go to talent and you can go to movie stars or TV stars, you can tell them like it's a feature, you know, this is where it's going. And I think that there's something really appealing to them about that, both at the, you know, at the studio network and to the talent. Um, and I, I just wanted to add that like the mystery or the detective story also really lends itself to limited series, like what Brad did. Um, you know, like I've worked on, on shows where one season didn't really have a mystery and then another season did, and that season just did so much better. And that, that is when I really started paying attention to that and how, you know, with, with a limited, if you, even if it's not genre, a mystery or a detective or some kind of thing that they're trying to solve, it just really lends itself well to that structure. And you can keep people's attention for about that many episodes. Um, and we can, as writers, really deliver something great in that amount of episodes. And so I think that's partly why a lot of feature writers and a lot of my favorite writers are being drawn to this, this, this part of television, because you can really deliver a great story in a short amount of time. I think that's a great that's a great point. I'm the one the one thing um, we haven't really talked about is targeting broadcasters. You know, so you've got this great idea, you've got some IP, maybe some attachments, maybe some scripts. Um, I don't know if you want to take this lane or anybody. Feel free to jump in. Um, how you know, as a viewer, sometimes you watch limited series. Uh, I really I love Doctor Death. That was fantastic, but I never would have expected Peacock to do that, right? Like as as a producer, as producers all in your own right, how do you target broadcasters? Um, if you don't have an overall, I guess, did, you know, was that a process that any of you guys went through trying to figure out what they're looking for before they even know it? I feel like actually you guys should answer that. <laughs> I mean, I can, I, you know, I'll jump in here, Nicole. Ours was pretty, um, I guess, I mean, I would imagine you do a, it, it depends on the material for our show. Kate had done a mini series at HBO, um, I knew Nora Skinner over there because I had done some projects with Nora in the past. So I had a relationship, Kate had a relationship with HBO. So that was sort of, you know, we pitched it around and we had a couple people interested, but at the end of the day, it, it came down to relationships. And again, I think people who understood what the show was. And, and also I, I will say we were very much, um, we wanted the show to have a weekly release and HBO was going to do that. So that was important to us on on Mare was a weekly release and not and not dump all the episodes at once because you know then you had people talking about the show for a week as opposed to a couple months. So it was a number of things, but it was relationships and also the you know HBO rolls out their shows a certain way, which we were convinced would work with Mare. So that's a really interesting point that you bring up about mysteries, right? I guess like dumping them all at once is a really bad thing for history because then you're going to have the people spoiling it for people who haven't had a chance to see it. I guess that's a particular concern, I'm assuming. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think it's tricky with the Sorry. mystery show. Especially if you live in Europe where if something <laughs> on HBO on Sunday night, right? You go to sleep in Europe and you wake up in the morning, you can't watch it even with a VPN and all kinds of you know magic you know, illegal magic. You can't watch it until the next day. And then it's already in the paper when you wake up, right? So we're always like behind the curve on the on the Sunday night HBO drops. So that's always a bummer. Just, you have to not read the news. The one thing I would say, um, both having been on the buying side and now selling a bunch of stuff this past year, um, I think it's really surprising. Like everyone goes out with their favorite and usually by the time you get all the offers and you're negotiating, you've changed what makes most sense for the show. So I would just say be open-minded. Um, the meetings will reveal a lot. 
the deal, the offers were, will reveal a lot because I don't think that, every, you know, like everyone has tears, you know, the buyers have tears and that meaning marketing support. Um, I also think too, you should be really thinking about um, weekly versus binge. Cause I think there are some shows on the flip side that really benefit from the word of mouth, from people watching the whole thing, you know? Um, so I think I would just say, be open, um, cast a wide net. Um, because I was, you know, on the projects that, cause Manhunt was, we baked it at Apple, but I have taken out several things and literally we have not, we've gone in thinking it was going to be one place. And by the end, we've landed somewhere totally different and, you know, changed our minds. The process changed our minds. So be open. Yeah. Fantastic. Do you want to jump in here at all, Davi? Because uh, FX, uh, was that oh. like, was that a, 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 did you have an overall at FX? Or was no, it, no, oh, but okay. my producer had a first look, which means oh. you're bound to go there first. And if they had passed, we would have gone to market. I mean, gotcha. in terms of broadcasters, I'm like, whoever will buy this, <laughs> I'll sell it to you. It was sort of my attitude. But I will say that what Lane was saying is so true. Like, I had a friend who had uh, two offers, one from, you know, Nat Geo, one from FX. And there's like, oh, I should go to FX because that's, you know, a fancier network. But the Nat Geo was just more excited and there was more of a chance of a green light over there. They just, you could tell she went with Nat Geo and now they're making the show. So I do think that go where you feel the love and you feel they want to make this. Not they think it's interesting and they want to get into business with you, but because they actually want to make the show. Yeah, that was a great point. All right, two last questions. Um, I have one that they'll, sorry, it's a little out of order, but they'll kill me if I don't ask it. So um, did you approach, because most of you have done ongoing series as well as limited, do you approach pitching uh, a limited series differently than an ongoing? Specifically, do you pitch out every episode of your limited, which you obviously wouldn't do in an ongoing, or is there, was there anything differently that you did? Um, I'll sort of answer the last question and this question together. I My two pilots before this one, I did not have an overall deal. Um, so I was going in just as myself as a writer. And um, I did not pitch every episode, definitely not. Some, some of the pilot um, I would pitch um, and I would pitch a sense of what the twist was or where the, what the ending was. Um, and then usually what would happen is that then they would pay me to write a format as part of, you know, like around the outline stage. And so I would do, um, you know, like an outline of the pilot and then a format describing in a couple paragraphs how I saw each episode or each one hour movie, like Davi was saying. Um, but no, I just don't think there's any way to hold people's attention to, to pitch that long um, in a pitch. So you don't really approach it differently than an ongoing series? I would approach it differently than an ongoing series because I would um, I would pitch it as sort of an, an arc for a character and an arc for a story as opposed to how am I going to generate story over time that's going to keep generating story what what's going to be the um, you know inciting incident for an ongoing series um, it, I would approach that differently yeah no that's great that's a great point anybody else no. All right. Well, let's, I wanted to do like a, uh, to end, I think we're, I think we're approaching the hour mark pretty soon. So as a quick round Robin, I'd love to, I'd love to hear everyone's, you know, like, what do you know now uh, that you wish you knew when you started your limited, you know, just as a uh, advice and, and, and hopefully some guidance for our audience. I, I'll start with Lane. I'll just go around <laughs> the way your, the way your lovely faces. Appear. Um, if this does not apply to manhunt, but I would say um, be figure out if there is a season two and it, it's kind of kind of I'm circling back to where we were at the, at the top of this and, and um, I'm thinking about series like Big Little Lies and, and, and things like that that were meant to be contained and then they were um, renewed and people were like just that satisfaction because I think you should shoot for the the moon you know and the stars and always maybe don't pitch it that way because I, I always hated that when people were like it could be either you know so I'm like really be focused but um if you have a, a, a big hit or you think you really have a story um 
I know this is probably counter and you guys are probably like, really, this is a very um, business way of thinking about it. But, um, you know, just like if it was a good experience having a way to maybe keep it going, which might not be the right thing to say at this moment, but it was the first thing that came to mind. No, there's no, there's no right or wrong answers. No, no. Well, and I think that maybe that's some of the success of anthology series, right? That, you know, Big Little Lies was an unusual example of them coming back as is, but sometimes you could come back in a second or third season, uh, you know, with like, I don't know if they're going to do this with Dr. Death, but on the podcast, they had a different doctor, you know, and a different, like a different case. And so to your point, thinking of ways to make it maybe an anthology series. All right, David, do you want to, do you want to take the question? Sure. What, what, what the question, what, what did I learn? What, what did you, what did you learn? Like what's one of your, one or many of your takeaways, you could have more than one that you uh, wish you knew when you started. If I had known how hard it is to run a show, I would have definitely done an ongoing series because you get all these <laughs> tools in your toolbox at the end of the season one. You're like, all right, season two is going to be a breeze. And then you're like, what? It's over. So I, I would just say, you know, I'd only worked on ongoing series before I did Miss America. I never actually worked on a limited. So I didn't really know what that's like. And I have to say from like loving all everyone on my writing staff to, you know, loving everyone on our crew and all our department heads, I was sad that it wasn't ongoing. And I, so I think it's like, really know what kind of creator showrunner you want to be. And if you're someone who like, really likes coming back year after year and really likes telling open-ended stories, you know, maybe limit is not free. You know, I think it's just knowing that it is a really different, creatively, it is quite different than doing ongoing. That said, it's very satisfying. It's such a gift to know you're writing to an ending because especially with ongoing, you'll get canceled and you can never, like knowing, I knew, knowing what the final scene was going to be when I opened the writer's room, it's just such a gift. So I think that's one of the joys of working on a limited series. Yeah, fantastic. I love that. And Brad, how about yourself? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I, I agree with Davi. It was really, really hard. And I came from the movie world where I didn't really you know, I didn't spend much time on the set at all. It really depends on the director, but some directors want you there a lot. And other directors really are glad you're gone. So um, for me, it was like the first really immersive experience in, in actually writing the whole thing and then being on the set every day and then having to edit. But I think what I learned is like, I'm, I don't love to be on set every day. Like I, it's not my strong suit, I would say, um, but I loved, editing the show. And so I think that was the experience I took from it was like, um, and I think when I, if I'm at set again, I will be able to be effective and say, okay, guys, I think this is what we're going to need in the edit. I think this is what we're going to need when we get in there. Because when I was on set, I, I had, I didn't know what I was doing in the edit, but I, I, I was allowed to edit the show, which was such a gift. And I think it taught me a lot about how to be a writer. And, 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 and the things you're absolutely going to need and the things that will probably end up on the uh, cutting room floor. And so I think the experience was hard a lot. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it, it certainly had its challenges, but I think I'll go back with a sense of um, a knowledge of, hey, I think these are the things we absolutely need to have out of the scene. And, and not that you're editing the whole thing in your head, because obviously you're working with the director who will get a cut of the show, but I think that was probably the most valuable lesson I learned was that I got to edit the show and I will go back with that. And, and I think that was such a gift. So anyway, I think that was the big lesson I took from there. Yeah, they often say the last rewrite, the last rewrite takes place in the edit suite, right? So that Oh, totally. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, we were, you know, we had all scenes from all episodes we were moving around, but it was great. You could tell your story again, you know, it was lovely. Oh, that's amazing. And Monica, you're next. My big lesson has been to pick a story with not a gigantic amount of characters and locations. <laughs> um, I did not realize the repercussions of that to the extent that I know now. Um, so, you know, when I watch like a succession or something, I'm like, oh, to have the same basic cast every episode with very few guest stars or recur it's, you know, it does make the whole thing you know, your budget and everything, um, a certain, you're tied to a certain thing. So I would definitely in the next story, keep an eye out for that. And I, I just wanted to give people out there a little hope too, that when I met Lane, when I first met Lane, 
I had a pilot that a network had decided not to make and I brought it to where she was at Netflix. And I also didn't get them to make it there, but she remembered me. And I thought it was like one of the worst days of my life because it was, it was so disappointing. And I was, I was with Noah Hawley who had come in with me to support me as a producer and everything. And I, you know, I just couldn't tell what their reaction was there. So you just never know. You could have a meeting where nothing comes of it and you think, oh, that's the end of the line for that relationship or that thing. And you just never know like what can come from that. Yeah, it's, it's so true. It's a, it's a marathon, right? I mean, this business is, a, is crazy. You never know where it's going to come from. And Anna, you're up last but not least. <laughs> it's the inspirational thing I've ever learned. I mean, I'm, I'm, still learning, I'm still learning all of it, you know, but I think it, it's, uh, you have to be a little bit crazy and you have to be really, really interested in kind of all of it three-dimensionally to do this. So I, I guess whether it's a limited or an ongoing series, but especially with the limited, you're kind of all in, it's incredibly intense. And um, yeah, it, you know, if you're going to make a limited, certainly it should be something you're super passionate and interested in because you're you're really, if you're writing and producing it, you're just in it so three-dimensionally that it should be something that you really love. Fair enough. Is there any, is there any uh, craft uh, advice that you can give us since, you know, you're, you're so in the trenches? <laughs> craft advice. Let's see. Yeah. I had a four-hour table read before this on Zoom, so I'm a little, um, fair enough. Sorry. I'm not as, you know, witty. Sorry to you put want. you on the spot. Um, craft wise. Um, well, you know, if you're the head writer of something, I think you have to be prepared to see it to the bitter end. And I think sometimes maybe it's a slightly different process um, in a limited that it would be in an ongoing series where you have writers who are like really getting, I, I have not worked on a big ongoing series, but with a limited at the end of the day, if you're the head writer and you created the show, you're really the one who's going to finish the whole thing as well. So that's a, it, you have to be prepared. And I think this is something I say a lot to young writers who work with me. It's like, if it's your show, then you have to be prepared to like run the whole way across the finish line with it. And that's as a writer, as a producer, in the music, in the, in the post-production, like all of it, it's, it's such a thorough, obsessive, holistic process. So it's not, the writing is just the beginning, you know, and the writing is incredibly important and sets you on the journey, but the journey, uh, the journey is the destination and you know that that experience is, is a big one so I think you really have to be prepared for that and I, I try to show the people working with me who really want to do this like how you do all of it like not just you know the writing but like all of it um, you know and there's many parts of it so yeah I had a better last thought which I think is um, to have all this okay. written um, because have all the what you cut out yeah, always. to build a schedule where you can have all the scripts written. Cause I've done it both ways. And I would say it's just a much more enjoyable process. And if you yeah. and sometimes because of talent, you have to go without them. But I think it's made manhunt so much easier that we had all the scripts written. Um, and I think that is really something that I would take from it. If you can really create a process for yourself where you're, you're, you know, basically done with that part before you start, you know, the production. Yeah. I think that's a lot better. I agree with Lane. I think that was one of the, yeah. it was one of the great gifts we had on Mayor B. And also Lane, because you're able to pivot in terms of the creative, like, yes, you know, the ending destination and that's always a lighthouse there. And then you can pivot, say, okay, we can't do that, but we know we still have to get there. It was so important. And, and I would be scared to go into any show without having all the scripts written so i think that's a really good point now obviously sometimes it's not possible but if at all possible i would argue to have all the scripts written because it makes your decisions on set so much easier if you have a clear a destination in mind and it allows you to focus sorry, on producing oh sorry sorry, sorry anna go ahead go ahead go ahead anna if you if you've mostly finished the writing then you can focus on producing the creative producing that goes on every day, as opposed to you know writing simultaneous to production. Um, but I think the schedule thing that Lane mentioned is really important also because then you can set up the schedule to like concentrate on certain parts of it that require, even if it's just a special location or whatever, you can really be there for that in the schedule. Um, Gabby, go ahead. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add on, which are all yeah. such great points. I just wanted to add a little piece of that, that yes, in that way, limited is more like features. So if you could have all the scripts ready and I didn't have the luxury of a schedule to do that and it was really hard. But I would add to that, because by having all the scripts ready before prep, um, you want those scripts to be producible. So I would really, my advice and I wish I'd done is bring on a line producer. It's not, maybe not even a line producer you're gonna have for production, but a line producer <laughs> to read your scripts and tell you if they're producible because what you don't want is to be in production and be told, this is over budget, you need to cut five scenes. And now you're actually writing on set. So, so that's something that because this, this is all evolving, that I've learned that you want a line producer to go through because the network's not gonna tell you whether it's producible, like that's on you. That's an excellent, excellent point. I, I love that piece of advice. Well, I mean, should we leave it there? Is that, is there anything else, like any pearls of wisdom you wanna you know, impart on the audience before we leave, please feel free to jump in or we can, uh, we can leave it with that great advice of like hire a line producer. Yeah, wait, wait, I'm gonna say okay. one more thing. <laughs> Please, so, go ahead. Another point which you made me think of, which is that, you know, many, if not most production solutions are found on the page. And if you can understand the numbers then the numbers can be your friend in terms of being able to execute what you're doing better and writing to, to something that you can actually make. And I think that that's something that, that's really to Davi's point. I think that's everything. I think as writers or as artists, we have this tendency to be like, I don't really wanna deal with the money. You know, it's, it's too scary or whatever, but actually once you understand how the money is being spent, it really, you can, you can make the version of it that you want by writing it to what you can actually shoot. So that's a really good point. Um, and excellent point. And I think something that maybe we do for ongoing series that, you know, maybe when you're doing a limited, you think, oh, you know, it's endless. I have, it's gonna, it's gonna be prestige television. I don't have a budget. <laughs> it's good to remind yourself. Yeah, every sandbox, everybody has a sandbox to play in. Well, thank you all for making time on a Saturday again. Uh, you know, uh, we, should, we should keep this to an hour because I know you all have lives that you want to get back to and probably tons and tons of work. So thanks for making the time. This was so informative and insightful and it was a pleasure to meet you all. And uh, for all the shows that we've seen and loved, thank you for those and for uh, stuff like Manhunt that's going to be on in the future. Really looking forward to it. So thanks. Thank you all. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> thank thanks, you. Nicole. Thanks, everybody. Take care, Thanks guys. Good luck on your show, guys. Goodbye. Bye, Bye all. Bye.